Good morning, I'm Pamela Landry. The scripture today is from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 18 through 20 in the New International Version. This is the prayer of David. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you and give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees and do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the King. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me for prayer, please? Father, with the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, occasionally, I waste time. Uh, occasionally, I waste time uh, on a good Google search. It's amazing to me what you can find. Uh, apparently, if you look, you can find uh, whole websites devoted all to jokes, like as in... Uh, how does a two-legged pig walk? One leg at a time, as we heard before. Um, yeah, that's right. That was you. That was your joke. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. I does He doesn't like me stealing his material. Um, uh, but one of the things that I really enjoy looking up is famous last quotes, which are usually just famous because the person said them or because. They're ironic, and so I wrote down just a few while I was, uh, you know, being unproductive this week. Um, Oscar Wilde said, either the wallpaper goes or I do. Um, Let's see, uh, Rudolph Valentino said, don't pull down the drapes, dear, I feel fine. Uh, My literary uh, teacher would love this. Uh, Apparently, James Joyce's last words, does no one understand? Uh, which is true because nobody gets, gets James Joyce. I still haven't. Read. Um, okay, so this is not a famous person, but uh, actually, apparently, a Civil War officer says they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Uh, but my absolute favorite one is attributed to Pancho Villa. And Pancho Villa, as he was dying, said the words, Don't let it end this way, tell them I said something. Yeah, uh, he's, he's like, he couldn't think of anything, and so he's, he's like outsourcing his famous last word. Like, I, I can't think of anything, but tell them that I said something inspirational or clever or humorous. Uh, it's amazing to me that he, he was thinking that far ahead, uh, but not quite far enough ahead to think of his last words before the time. Um, the scripture we read today uh, are not David's last words. But the last time he was publicly addressing uh, the nation of Israel through his court, it was a a last bit of intercession. You see, at the time of this happening, David was an older king. He uh, was getting up there in age. Uh, Solomon was already taking on some of the governmental responsibilities. Now, we, we think that the succession of Solomon to David was just like, snappy and easy, but that's not true. Uh, David had other sons, and at one point, uh, a son uh, who was older than Solomon uh, saw his father, uh, who was up there in age and not feeling well, and he decided to proclaim himself and have other people proclaim him as king. Bathsheba then went to David and said, hey, you promised that Solomon could be king, and so David said, you're right, I did. So then David had Solomon pronounced as king even while David was still alive, which is not customary. That happened before this. So this is the actual passing of the torch. This is the time where David is basically saying, I am old. I no longer want to be king. I kind of want to retire. So this is that time of intercession at the kind of passing of the torch from David to Solomon. 
It's not David's last words. Uh, in, sec- in First Chronicles, there's another time that is more private with, with Solomon where David gives a, a private blessing to Solomon. But these are some of the last public words of David, and they are a prayer. And I wanted to just uh, mention three items uh, that David says in this. The first is he prays to the Lord for the entire nation of Israel that they would keep their hearts loyal to Him. This has significance for two reasons in my head. First is that David is the only man in Scripture who is described as a man after God's own heart. So the idea, and it seems kind of obvious, that, Jesus, that, that David would pray that the people remain loyal to God My second thought is that David knows the history of his people. He knows that whenever things get tough for the Israelites, they have a tendency to look backwards, to to look past the 40 years of wandering, past uh, the uh, Lord providing them with manna, past the Red Sea parting, past the Passover, and look back at the slavery in Egypt and say, oh, that was a good time. Let's return to Egypt and to slavery because we would rather face slavery than face the unknown. And so David knows this about his people. So his prayer, one of his final prayers for the entire nation of Israel is that they would keep their hearts loyal to God. We're going to come back to that in a second. Hold on to that. And then his prayer goes to his son, Solomon, who at this time uh, is uh, a young man taking on some responsibilities already. And he prays two things that I want to point out. One, give Solomon wholehearted devotion to you. I think with this, David understands the pressures that a king has. He understands that kings hold uh, sometimes the power of life and death in their hand. They balance internal and external uh, pressures uh, for a kingdom. Public image... Loyalty, foreign relations, taxation, war, peace, negotiations, all the things that a king has to deal with, David understands and is praying for his son Solomon that, but I don't think that's all of it. I think there's more. I think David also understands that a king has the means to find escapes from those pressures. And that the escapes from those pressures can sometimes lead kings to bad things. So he prays for his son to be wholehearted, be devoted to the Lord. To me, I think David is one of the few public figures we see that is absolutely the same in public as in private. At least that's the way I read his history is that he is the man after God's own heart. We see the same David in the court as we do at home with his children. And I think Solomon had the privilege of growing up in that. He had the privilege of seeing his father pray, of seeing his father confess, of seeing his father deal with the pressures of being a king by the psalms and songs that he wrote. That's how David, I think, escaped those pressures, is he sought out the Lord. And David was the same, both publicly and privately. And I tell you that's rare because I believe it's rare. I would love to tell you about myself and tell you that uh, Pastor Patrick and all of my patience and all the things that I say here translates to 100% at home, and you know I'd be lying, right? Right? My kids, they never leave the house without me or my wife. They demand that I feed them every day. Every day they want food. you believe that? (laughs) And then, uh, I just want to, just while I'm ranting, uh, talk to you about laundry. It is my responsibility for doing laundry. And I'm quite certain that my children make more laundry for me just for fun. (laughs) I think they just take clothes. Well, I looked at it. It's dirty. I looked at that. It's dirty. Like, laundry is piling up now at my house. I can tell you that. My kids might not be home, and laundry is happening. And it's not getting smaller. It's getting bigger for me to do. At the same time, I would love to tell you that I always represented a pastoral persona to my children, and I don't. 
I fail so often in that. And though I'm not telling you that David was perfect, what I am telling you is that I think the David at home was the same as the David in the courts. At least that's the way I read it. And as I see David preparing the way and interceding on behalf of his entire nation and on behalf of his son Solomon, we see David looking at faith intergenerationally. Hold on to that because we're going to come back to it. I would love to talk about that and I could talk about it for hours, but there's something else going on here that I want to focus on as well. And that is when David prays for Solomon to be able to build the palatial structure for which he has provided. Let me explain what David's talking about here. You see, last week I told you that David was the first real king of Israel. Saul was a warrior king. He was more like a warlord. David was the first real king, the first one who embodied all the things that the Lord had for a king. And when he consolidated his power and brought the capital into Jerusalem, he had one desire to do first. And it wasn't to build himself a palace, and it wasn't to fortify the city. His desire was to build a temple for the Lord. He was thinking, I think, that hey, all the other gods, the gods of the Philistines and the gods of all the people that were in the promised land before us, all their, their gods who aren't real have temples. Why should our God who is real uh, lives in a tent? He should live in a structure. Over this also, the people were becoming a people of the wilderness, becoming a people of the city. Excuse me. They were a people of the wilderness, and they were becoming a people of the city. And so David wanted a city for the Lord to live in, a city attributed to the Lord. And of course, he chose Jerusalem. And if you know anything about the news, Jerusalem is still in contestation today and has been through all of history. But David wanted to make a palace, a temple, so that the glory and the beauty of worshiping the Lord would be reflected in a building, and the Lord told him no. The Lord told him, no, David, you are a man of war. You will not build my temple, but your son Solomon will. And so David did what he could, and what he could do is he started to accumulate the items needed to build the temple. He donated his own gold and silver. He had other kings and leaders in the area pay tribute in gold and silver directly to the temple. He imported cedar from Lebanon because uh, their cedar does not rot. He imported craftsmen. He built relationships with other kingdoms so that Solomon would be able uh, to get the things he needed. He bought the land on top of the rock. And if you remember a sermon a few months back, you heard me saying that it's possible that that's the very spot where Abraham offered the sacrifice of Isaac. He even had the plans drawn out for the temple. As I was doing research on that this week, um, between Google searches for jokes and uh, for famous last quotes, um, I noticed that a scholar a few years back had calculated uh, the cost of just the gold and silver that David had accumulated based on modern-day gold and silver prices. Uh, and I'm sure it's higher than this now, but at the time of his calculation, David had accumulated about $4 billion dollars worth of gold and silver in order just to build one building so that the worship of the Lord would, again, reflect the glory and the beauty of the Lord. And so he prayed that Solomon would be able to complete that task so that the people and Solomon would have a God to worship and a building to worship him in that was in the place that they lived. So he was praying for Solomon to build the temple so that Solomon could stay devoted and that the people could stay loyal. In this, we see David not just giving of prayer, but giving of his resources, and giving, most importantly, of his time with Solomon, as you would see if he kept on reading a little bit in First Chronicles. And here's the deal. It worked. Just a couple chapters after that, we read in 2 Chronicles, when Solomon is king, David has gone before him. This is 2 Chronicles 1, 7 through 10. And that night, 
God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to David my father and have made me king in his place. Now, Lord God, let your promise of my father David be confirmed. For you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. For who is able to govern this people of yours? So, just so we're really clear about this. God gave Solomon a blank check. Whatever you want, I will give to you. And Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge. And just as I'm thinking about this, a couple of things come to mind. One, David had already passed on, but I'm certain he was up in heaven celebrating. His son had been given a blank check and asked for wisdom and knowledge. If that was me, there'd be balloons, possibly cigars. I mean, it'd be exciting, okay? He did it. I succeeded. My son has asked for wisdom and knowledge. That would be a token, a huge celebration for me. But as we go forward and read a little bit more in the Scripture, we see even God seeming surprised at what Solomon asked for. And he says, okay, hold on. Whoa, wait, stop. You didn't ask for uh, wealth or power or glory or the death of your enemies. Okay, uh, Solomon, since you didn't ask for that thing and you asked for wisdom and knowledge, I'm going to give you it all. This is Solomon winning both showcases in the showcase showdown, if you know what I'm saying. He gets it all. No Price is Right fans in here? Okay, never mind. All right, okay. Both showcases, he gets it all. The Lord has promised him everything that he needs going forward. But here's the real proof. We know that David wrote Psalms, or at least a lot of the Psalms. Solomon wrote a lot of the Proverbs. And listen to this. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Solomon got it. He understood that all the things that he was able to achieve, the building of the temple, massive amounts of wealth and peace in the promised land for the first time in hundreds, maybe even a thousand years, was not due to anything beyond his own knowledge and wisdom, and he knew to ask for it, not by his own power, but by the intercessions and the prayers and the leadership that David, his father, had provided to him. So in our last moments, I'd like to share this with you. We have that same opportunity and that same responsibility. We, as believers in Christ, have a responsibility to those who are coming after us, to teach them in the ways of the Lord, to pray for them and to provide what we can for them. And let me tell you this. I once heard a children's pastor say that children spell love, T-I-M-E. And I believe it. I haven't found any reason to not trust that. And so today, if you are interested in pouring more and more into the next generation, you can do that with the, your primary responsibility, your little ones, but also there are children over there. There are youth over there, and they always need folks to pour into them. If it's something that you're interested in, find me after this. We can hook you up with Catherine or Carly that you can pour into the next generation of believers. Because I believe that while Solomon did something that David couldn't do, that the next generation of believers can do things that we can't. Would you pray with me?